In other words, the millisievert is a derived number based on the mathematical models which are used to convert the absorbed dose to effective dose. So what is the increased health risk to Japanese based upon their exposure to 20 millisieverts per year? This is, uh, let's examine the figures constructed on the basis of data published by the National Academy of Sciences. It was provided to me by Ian Gard. The vertical y-axis is calibrated to the number of cancer cases per 100,000 age peers. And the horizontal x-axis depicts the age of the population beginning at zero years and moving towards old age. Examine the allegedly safe dose of 20 millisieverts per year. As a result of this exposure, there will be about 1,000 additional cases of cancer in female infants and 500 cases of cancer in infant boys per 100,000 in their age groups. There will be an additional 100 cases of cancer in 30-year-old males in their age groups. Now, notice that children, especially girls, are at most risk from radiation-induced cancer. In fact, female infant has seven times greater risk, and a five-year-old girl has five times greater risk of getting a radiation-induced cancer than does a 30-year-old man. I want to note here that there's a great deal of controversy in regards to the accuracy of the methods used to arrive at the millisievert measurement, especially in regard to an accurate determination of the biological effects of an external versus internal exposure to ionizing radiation. That is, the effects of an exposure to a source of ionizing radiation that is external to the body versus an exposure that comes from the ingestion of radionuclides that provide a chronic, long-term internal exposure to living cells which are adjacent to the radioactive atoms or particles. In the land surrounding Chernobyl and Fukushima, the primary route of internal exposure is through the ingestion of foodstuffs contaminated with cesium-137, which tends to bioaccumulate in plants and animals. What this means is that cesium-137 cannot be excreted faster than it's being ingested. Thus, it accumulates and increases in its concentration in the plant or animal that's routinely ingesting it. Cesium-137 also tends to biomagnify as it moves up the food chain. This means it becomes progressively more concentrated in predator species. We've seen this before with other industrial toxins, such as DDT, which can magnify its concentration millions of times from the bottom to the top of the food chain. Consequently, all of the foodstuffs in a contaminated region tend to contain cesium-137. Those naturally rich in potassium, such as mushrooms and berries, tend to have very high concentrations. Dairy products and meats also tend to have higher concentrations. The International Commission on Radiological Protection, the ICRP, which sets radiation safety standards, recognizes that cesium-137 bioaccumulates in humans. This ICRP figure compares a single ingestion of uh, 1,000 becquerels of cesium-137, a one-time exposure, with a daily ingestion of 10 becquerels. On a single exposure, notice that half the cesium-137 is gone from the body in 110 days. That's considered the biological half-life. Note also that with a routine daily ingestion of 10 becquerels of cesium-137, the total radioactivity within the body continues to rise until after about 500 days, there are more than 1,400 becquerels of radioactivity measured in the body. Becquerels can be counted in living persons because cesium-137, the decay of cesium-137 emits gamma radiation which passes through the body and can be measured by a whole body counter. So they have a chair that kids can sit in, or anyone, and they can, they can calculate the amount of uh, becquerels per kilogram of body weight. So in a 70 kilogram adult, based on this, a total body activity of 1,400 becquerels would correspond to 20 becquerels per kilogram of body weight. And a 20 kilogram child would be 70 becquerels per kilogram of body weight. The ICRP document does not specify the average age or weight of those examined in the study. However, the safety standards that have been set by the nuclear industry do not consider this level of chronic exposure to so-called low-dose radiation to be a significant danger to human health. The ICRP states in this document that a whole body activity of 1,400 becquerels is equivalent to an exposure one-tenth of millisievert per year. In other words, the radiation models used by radiation biologists to convert this level of internal absorbed dose to effective dose do not predict serious health risks from such exposures. In fact, they stated it's safe to have 10 times this exposure level. There is, however, strong evidence that the ingestion of these levels of so-called low-dose radiation are, in fact, particularly injurious to children. Research done by Dr. Yuri Banachevsky and his colleagues and students in Belarus during the period 1991 through 1999 correlated whole body radiation levels of 10 to 30 becquerels per kilogram of whole body weight with abnormal heart rhythms and levels of 50 becquerels per kilogram of body weight with irreversible damage to the tissues of the heart and other vital organs. 
This is Radio Ecoshock. Our speaker is Stephen Starr on cesium after nuclear accidents. One of the key discoveries made by Banachewski was that cesium-137 bioconcentrates in the endocrine and heart tissues, as well as the pancreas, kidneys, and intestines. This goes completely against one of the primary assumptions used by the ICRP to calculate effective dose as measured by millisieverts, that cesium-137 is uniformly distributed in, in, in human tissues. Let me restate that this current ICRP methodology, the current ICRP methodology, is to assume that the absorbed dose is uniformly distributed in human tissues. This is, in fact, not the case. The table taken from Banachesi's chronic cesium-137 incorporation in children's organs compares the radioactivity measured in 13 organs of six infants. Very high specific activity, that is, levels of radioactivity, often 10 times higher than in other organs of tissues were found in the pancreas, thyroid, adrenal glands, heart, and intestinal walls. Banachewski summarized his nine years of research in the study entitled Radioactive Cesium in the Heart. With the help of friends, I've just finished editing a new Russian-English translation of this work. It was never previously translated, in large part because shortly after Dr. Banachewski presented it to the parliament and the, Pel- and the president of Belarus, he was summarily arrested and imprisoned. Government agents entered the medical institute which he directed and destroyed his archived slides and samples. After he was released from prison, he was held under house arrest. It was during this time that he actually wrote the study. He did so in an attempt to preserve his research, knowing that he was about to be in prison again for a very long time. Just as Soviet physicians were forbidden to diagnose a radiation-related illness following Chernobyl, the Belarusian government acted to suppress the work of Banachewski, who had been protesting government efforts to resettle people back into land badly contaminated with cesium-137. In radioactive cesium in the heart, Banachewski also did a correlation between the amount of cesium-137 in live children and their heart function. He worked with the Belarus Institute, which conducted more than 100,000 whole body counts in Belarusian children, measuring the amounts of internally ingested cesium-137 in each child. There were so many contaminated children in Belarus that it was difficult to find any with zero becquerels per kilogram. However, only those with less than 10 becquerels per kilogram of body weight had normal electrocardiograms. 35% of the children with 11 to 37 becquerels per kilogram had normal ECGs. 20% of children with 37 to 74 becquerels per kilogram had normal ECGs, and only 11% of those with 74 to 100 becquerels per kilogram had normal ECGs. This slide, which shows the average results from hundreds of autopsies done during 1997, is also taken from radioactive cesium in the heart. Notice a very high concentration of cesium-137 in the thyroid gland. While we generally worry about radioactive iodine concentrating in the thyroid, Banachewski's work shows us that cesium-137 is likely to play a major role in thyroid cancer, too. I want to point out again that the currently accepted medical and legal understanding of cesium-137 is that it is, quote, distributed fairly uniformly, unquote, in human tissues. I copied the webpage from the U.S. EPA website from which this quote is taken. Clearly, uh, clearly, the autopsy human tissues samples analyzed by Banachewski show that this is not the case. This new understanding needs to be incorporated into the way we understand how internally ingested radionuclides act upon the human body. Two million people in Belarus live on land severely contaminated by cesium-137. Most of the children who live there are not considered to be healthy, although they were before the nuclear power plant at Chernobyl exploded. Fourteen years after the explosion, 45 to 40 percent of high school graduates had physical disorders, including gastrointestinal anomalies, weakened hearts, and cataracts, and 40% were diagnosed with chronic blood disorders and malfunctioning thyroids. I'm afraid that there are many Japanese people now living on lands equally contaminated with radioactive cesium. If Japanese children are allowed to routinely ingest foodstuffs contaminated with cesium-137, they will likely develop the same health problems that we see now in the children and teenagers of Belarus and Ukraine. Thus, it's very important that we recognize the danger posed to children by the routine ingestion of contaminated food with cesium-137 wherever they might live. It's also important to prevent further nuclear disasters which release these fiendishly toxic poisons into the global ecosystems. Given the immense amounts of long-lived radionuclides which exist at every nuclear power plant, this is an urgent task. I hope I've made it clear that long-lived radionuclides produced by nuclear power plants are neither safe nor clean. What suggests that it is a very bad idea to manufacture these nuclear poisons to try to make electricity that it's past time we stop manufacturing them and try to manage those which we have already created 
which must be isolated from the ecosystems for at least 100,000 years.